And when we stand firmly on the word of God, we have a firm foundation that cannot be shaken. And that, you know, is part of what brings back the prodigal. For them to see us operating in the love, the mercy, the grace, and the power of a living God makes a difference in our lives. Like I said, Jelly and, and Randy were pastors in Tacoa, and uh, uh, Tacoa was, was Randy and Jelly's first church. And then they went to, to Griffin and took the church there, and just it grew and blossomed and just had a tremendous, powerful ministry. Uh, Randy and Jelly have ministered around the world. Uh, they have touched lives, powerful missions ministry. Uh, I know you, his heart was always in missions and getting the word out. Uh, and just uh, in so many different uh, arenas. But I don't want to take any more time. Jelly, if you'll just come and just uh, share your heart and share the heart of the Lord with us this morning. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you. Such an honor to be here today. Wow. I'm not going to tell you how long it's been since, um, well, I will tell you too. We moved to Tacoa in 1984, and that's how long we've known um, Pastor Jeff and, and Gail. And I, I was telling Gail, I think it's been 30 years probably since I've seen them. Um, she came to Griffin for a homeschool conference, but I didn't get to see her that time. But anyway, what a great, what a great church you have. How friendly. You know, I've, I've, I've been to a few churches, and um, there are some that, you know, I've walked into and it's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> we went to run one right after mom uh, moved in with me about six months after she moved in with me. We, I was at this church um, just around the corner from my house and um, there's a friend of mine. He was pastoring and uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to I'm going to visit his church this morning. So we went and I found a seat and um, this woman came up and she just stood and looked at me. And I said, hi. She just stood there, never said a word. And I said, am I in your seat? She said, yes. <laughs> said, Let me move real quick. <laughs> so I did. I moved. Said, but you, you guys are not like that. You just have a precious, precious spirit in this group of people. And I appreciate the invitation to come. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and uh, I do, Pastor Jeff mentioned, I have my mom here with me. She's, uh, she moved in with me in 1921, or 2021, not, not 1921. <laughs> Dear Lord, that would make us really old, Gail. <laughs> 2021. And then I also have my granddaughter here with me. Um, she, Jaylee is um, not... Uh, one of the ladies uh, that we met earlier accused her of being in college. No, she's not. So don't any of you older guys think that she's uh, college age. She's not that. She's a freshman in high school. And uh, she is my, um, my personal assistant. Um, I, I did bring some books with me. I'll I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll mention these to you. Uh, and they're back on the table. And Jaylee will take your money. She'll take your credit card. She'll take your checks. But don't take the books without paying for them, okay? Um, there's one book. It's called um, Finding Significance in an Insignificant Place. And Randy wrote this. Um, it was probably one of the first books he wrote. Uh, he, I think I also brought um, Evidences of Faith. And that was the first one that he, he wrote. I didn't bring that one up here. But this one, uh, it's, it's um, you know, when you get into a place where you don't know what you're doing there and you feel insignificant and you feel like God can't use you, this book is for you. Um, then this one was, uh, is called Betrayed. If you have ever been betrayed in life, you need this book. It will help you walk through your betrayal, walk through your sorrow, and, and help you to come through it without being bitter and without being angry. And this, this is a really, it's a very anointed book. This one, Tapestry, I started writing, um, just to give you a little background, if you, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and open them up to Luke chapter 15 while I'm talking. Um, but um, Randy, uh, Randy and I were married almost 40 years, and um, he went into the hospital for um, a, a routine surgery, and things went bad, 
and he passed away. And um, we had started writing this book, Tapestry, about three weeks before he died. We um, were supposed to be in Washington, D.C., and uh, I was packing my suitcase. He said, no, we're not going to Washington. And I said, okay, let me take the clothes back out, you know, because he, he could just put a pair of socks and a pair of shoes and a carry-on, and he was good to go. took me a little bit longer. Um, but um, he said, no, 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 we're going to go over to the lake, and we're going to hash out this book. Randy was adopted when he was three days old. All of his life, he thought he was Italian. And in 2001... Um, we, through a process of events, we had, uh, our oldest daughter had gotten very ill. And uh, through a process of events, we found out that Randy was not Italian. He was half Iranian and half German. And it was a real culture shock for us because in 2001, you don't want to be Iranian. And um, so we, we um, started the process of meeting his birth mother, and she's the one who told him that he was half Iranian. And um, it, it was just a really unique adventure to see what, what he was, the product of an affair, and he was given up for adoption, uh, brought into a Christian home. He could have been raised Muslim. He could have been raised, um, you know, heathen. But he was brought into a Christian home, and God called him into ministry. And the things that God did in our lives together, and this is the story. It's a story of adoption, acceptance, and destiny. And then today, uh, I will be talking somewhat on, or I'll, all the, th throughout the, the message this morning, I'm going to be talking about Pathways of a Prodigal. This is a sermon series that Randy preached, um, and when we had our first prodigal. And if you know anything about ministry, you know that you don't preach about something you're going through. <laughs> Because you can, you can really mess up. But he felt like the Lord had given him a mandate. And so he began to study the story of the prodigal. And as we walked through our first prodigal daughter, uh, the Lord gave him some principles. And I want to give you some of those principles this morning. But before I do, I want you to stand up and let's read the word. In Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11, and I'm reading from the New International Virgin, Version. <laughs> I'm not reading from that one. Um, <laughs> the parable of the lost son. And Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as a citizen to that country, and he sent him to, to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Precious Jesus, thank you for this time that we can come together and learn more about your word, learn more about the principles that we need to live by. And I just ask that you would bless in this service today, Lord, that the principles that we talk about will go into our hearts and we can put them into practice in our lives. Father, anoint your word and anoint the rest of this service in your precious name. Amen. Okay, so you may be seated. I don't want you to stand the whole time I'm talking. I might get long-winded here. What time do you usually let out? 12, 12, 30, 1? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go that long, I promise. Um, so here we are, and we are, are, I'm going to assume that there are people in here who are believers in, in Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm going to assume that there are parents who are here. That, um, you know, maybe your children are with you, maybe they're not with you, but you have, you know, you, you have some things that you have to do. When, when Randy and I first got married, we got married in 1980, 
finished college. Uh, he was a youth pastor. I taught school. And then after, after um, four years of living uh, as a youth pastor and a school teacher, the Lord called us to Tekoa. And we had just had our first daughter. She was four months old. And oh, what an amazing journey that was. My mother never told me. My father never told me that when you become a parent, you're a parent for the rest of your lives. <laughs> Did you know that? So, young people, you just remember this. If you decide that you're, you're going to be a parent, or maybe you don't decide, but you become a parent, you're a parent from here on out. It never stops. Never. For some reason, I just had the idea that I could raise my child till she was 18, and then my job was over. And Randy and I would just go on, and we'd have, you know, empty nest syndrome, and we would just go and play it. Mm -mm, doesn't work that way. So as parents, we have to know what our job is. We have to know what, what do we do as parents. And I'm going to give you some principles. Some of you are already past this, but I'm just going to give you some principles. First of all, as a parent, if you are going to do your job, you have to know your own walk with the Lord. You have to. You cannot just go with this haphazardly and say, well, I think I'll do this today and I think I'll do that today. Uh, tomorrow, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll live for Jesus today. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll live for, you know, myself the next day. You can't do that. You, you have to know your own walk with the Lord. Read the Bible. Pray. Know what it is to dig in when you have an issue. I loved the worship this morning because it's all directed toward Jesus and toward, you know, deepening your walk with him. And so we have to know. We have to know know the scripture and um, in Colossians 1 9 it says for this reason since the day we heard about you we have not stopped praying for you we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives how do we find out what the will of the father is we pray we read our bibles we dig into the word of god to find out what it is that the lord wants us to do the second thing we have to do as parents is love and respect one another we have lost something in marriages and in families today that we're not teaching our children to love and respect one another because we don't love and respect the person we're married to. We don't love and respect that, that person. They, your children should never need to question whether or not you love your husband. And husbands, your, your children should never need to question whether or not you respect and love your wife. We have got to teach that, and we demonstrate it with our children. If you have been dis disrespectful or less than loving, then you, I challenge you today to apologize to your spouse and apologize to your children and say, you know what, I've not, I've not treated your mother right. I've not treated your father right, and I am sorry, and I want to apologize and move forward from this day. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, it says, However, each one of you, must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect your hu her husband. So we've, we've got to teach that, and we teach it by demonstrating it. You know, children, there, there's an old, um, old prose that says children learn what they live, and they do. They, 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 they follow your example, they, whether it's a positive example or whether it's a negative example. They are going to do what you demonstrate to them more than what you tell them. Third thing we need to do is cultivate an atmosphere of peace in your home. Oh, now this is a hard one. <laughs> this is a hard one. Especially, you know, Randy was strong-willed, and I'm strong-willed. Um, and sometimes we had a battle of the wills. Not on purpose, but we did. And there were times that, that I would just have to step back and say, okay, wait a minute, let me turn on some praise and worship music. Uh, we, need, we need to refocus here. And sometimes we, we need to cultivate that atmosphere of peace in our home and that atmosphere of love in our home. Uh, Matthew 13, 13 says, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. Oh, I love that. You know, there have been a lot of times when, since, since Randy passed away. It was, it was so sudden, so unexpected. And I would just be so agitated. And I'm, I would wonder, you know, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with that? You know, what? And I would just have to say, okay, I, 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 I need peace, Lord. I, I, need, I need to turn my eyes on you. I need to stop focusing on the circumstances. And I need to have peace in this house. When Randy died, there were seven people living in my house. 
and I didn't have time to step back and, and commiserate. I, I, had, I had two nephews that I was raising after the death of both of their parents. Jaylee and Jordan were living with me. My youngest daughter, Elena, was living, and then there was me and Randy, and, and two dogs, and, and, um, you know, and then all kinds of critters running around in the backyard that I didn't know whose they were. Um, feral cats and possums and raccoons and, you know, all kinds of little critters like that. And, um, you know, I would, I won't tell you what I did with the possums, but anyway, I don't like possums. Um, they were, one of them bit one of my dogs one time, and I just said, no, we're not, you're not going to live. So anyway, um, <laughs> you cultivate that atmosphere of peace in your home. Fourth thing we need to do as couples, as families, is make decisions together as a couple. Don't just make decisions based on what's good for you. Make decisions as a couple. Uh, do what is best for the family. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and, and these things will be added to you. When, you. when you are in agreement in your home, then your children will see that agreement in you, and they'll go, oh, this is the way I need to search for a spouse, someone that we can be in agreement with, someone that we can, I can love and respect. Fifth thing is, and Pastor Jeff, you're going to love this one, Find a strong, stable church environment. Strong, stable church environment. Don't move around from church to church. You know, there used to be an old song that said, don't you be doing that church hop. Don't do the church hop. You know, you, there's always going to be somebody you don't like in that church. There's always going to be something you don't like. Miss Gail might do something you don't like. And you go, I'll just go somewhere else. No, you won't. Stop it. Stop it. Grow up and be a an authentic, mature Christian. Don't be nitpicking at Pastor Jeff's sermons. Find a strong, stable church environment and stay there. Get your children involved. Sometimes it becomes necessary to change churches. You know, maybe a job changer or, or you know, maybe there's something that happens and, and you, you, um, you, know, you can't go to church any longer. You have to watch online or, you know, other reasons that happen. And you might have a legitimate reason, but there is not a legitimate reason for you to change churches every six months. There's just not. So find that church and get involved in that church. Get your children involved in the church. Teach them to serve. Teach them to, to love one another and to accept others' differences. And the sixth thing is prioritize your church attendance. Now, I got in trouble with this one not too long ago. I said, and I didn't finish my thought, but I said, you don't need to be getting up and going hunting on Sundays. Boy, did I alienate some men, <laughs> and I didn't mean to. I meant you don't need to be getting up and going hunting on, on Sundays if you can't go to church after you hunt, <laughs> okay? It doesn't need to be an every Sunday thing just because it's deer season. You don't go hunting on deer season. You know, you can always find an excuse to miss church. Did you know that? There's always a reason. You can, you know, I, I, I think I twisted my ankle or my my the back of my leg hurts a little bit today. I think I'll just put my feet up and stay home. Um, my kids were really grumpy yesterday. I think I think they just need a break. Or you know we had we had travel ball or we had cheerleading and we've been gone all weekend and we need to you know we just need to stay. We just need a break. You know what? If you start finding excuses for your children to miss church they are going to find excuses the rest of their lives to miss church. And going to church and being involved in church should be a priority in your life. Even my, my two nephews who have been with me now for six years. It's hard to believe it's been six years. They've been with me six years. They know when they come home, if they are home on Sunday, they're going to church. I don't care what time they got in on Saturday night. They're going to church on Sunday morning. They may not go with me, but they're going to church somewhere. They're going to be in, in church. As adults, we've got to teach them that they, they, they can have all the excuses in the world, but they've got to go to church. So prioritize your church attendance. Number seven, build emotional, spiritual, and physical relationships with your children. Talk to them. Even when they become adults, call them. Take time to talk to them. Take time to build that relationship with your children and let them know that they are important. My kids know if I hear the phone ring and it's one of them on the phone, I'm going to answer it. 
I'm not going to put them off. I'm going to answer. I'm going to I'm going to spend as much time as I possibly can trying to build that relationship and maintain the relationship with my children. Um, Ephesians 6, 4, I love this one. It says, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And Proverbs 22, 6 says, start children off in the way they should go. And even when they're old, they'll not turn from it. And you start them off right. You build those relationships and you, you maintain those relationships. And then number eight, supervise your children. Supervise them. We built a pool in our backyard because we wanted our teenage daughters to have their friends at our house. Not somebody else's house, our house. Because I knew what was happening at my house. I didn't know what was happening at somebody else's house. Get involved in their schools. Get in, you know, call, call and, and see what you can do with their, with their teachers. You know, how, how can I help you? You know, I, my, my daughter's in your class. My son's in your class. What can I do to help you? How can, how can I help the school? So get involved as much as possible. And number nine, honor the leadership in your church. Um, when you go home from church today, you should not be tearing apart everything I've said. When Pastor Jeff preaches or Miss Gail speaks and preaches on Sundays, you should not be going home and tearing apart everything they've said. You should be honoring the leadership in your church. And you know what else? You don't just honor. It starts in your church. You honor the leadership in your church. And as you honor the leadership in your church, then you honor the teachers who teach them every single day. You honor the principals of the school. You honor the police officers. You, you, those that have authority in their lives. You teach your children that we honor and we respect them. And as a result, they will honor and respect them. And they're not going to be one of those kids that gets uh, in a car and starts driving too fast, going up 400, and they're going 140 miles an hour because there's a police officer on their tail. They will stop. They will stop because they've learned to honor and respect those in authority over them. And um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, it says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish them, who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work and live in peace with one another. Do we need peace? I am so sick of hearing about this election. I'm so sick of it. I am sick of turning on Fox News. And that's the only news I watch. I'm sorry if y'all watch something else. But I am sick of there not being any news but politics and what Biden said or what Trump said or what Harris said. I'm sick of that. There's more news besides politics. There's something else going on. But we have got to hold the whole people in the highest regard. I get really irritated. And Mom and I were talking about this not too long ago. I get really irritated when I see people on social media talking bad about the President of the United States, saying ugly things about him, or ugly things about the former President, or ugly things about Vice President. I get really irritated because it shows that they do not know the Word of God when they're, when they're talking negative about people. And that one was free. Number 10. Don't expect the church to do it all. So you're, lay, you're laying the foundation of godliness in your home to start with. And you, you don't want to have a prodigal. You don't want your child to walk away from the things of God. So you're laying this foundation. But you can't expect the church to do it all. You cannot expect your kids to come to church on Sunday mornings and do Sunday school or children's church. And then on Wednesday nights do Bible study. And that's the only Jesus they ever get. You've got to live it day after day after day in your home. Going down the road, somebody pulls in front of you. They better not hear a bad word come out of your mouth. Because then they're going to think it's okay when they get upset for them to say the bad word. Only thing you can say is, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. Help them, Jesus. That's, that, that's what they need to hear. We cannot expect the, the, the church to do everything Deuteronomy 6, chapter, verse, or chapter 6, verses 6 through 9 says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your home and on your gates. When the word of God is paramount, 
and it is the most important thing in your life, your children are going to know it. They should be able to listen to you talk about the good things that were said on Sunday, the good things that were said in Sunday school, the good things that were said in children's church. What did you learn? What did you learn? What did you know? How, how do we how do we apply this to our lives on a daily basis? How do we bring everything that has been said in our formal instruction into our daily lives? You've got to do it. Because the church can't do it all. So you may, you may say, okay, I've done all this. My kids are grown. I've done all this, and I still have a prodigal. I still have someone who has walked away from everything I've taught them. Um, when, when our daughter Jordan um, walked away from the things of God, she was in ministry school. She was in her second year of ministry school. Her second year of a three-year program. And she walked away from the things of God. We had no clue this was going on in her life. We had no clue. No understanding at that point in time. We came, she had, she had fallen into sin, and she got kicked out of the ministry program that was in our church. Talk about ashamed and embarrassed and wondering, okay, God, how did we miss this? How did we miss it? And there are no answers as to exactly how we missed it. We only know that she walked away from the things of God. And it was very, very difficult. We came home from a meeting and um, thought she was sleeping in. And um, she wouldn't answer her phone. She wouldn't, you know, she lived upstairs and she wasn't, she wasn't coming to the door and so Randy went upstairs, and while we were at that ministry meeting trying to further the gospel of Jesus Christ, our daughter packed everything she had and moved out. We didn't know where she was. We didn't know what she was doing. We just knew she was gone. And it was very difficult. You know, preachers are not supposed to have prodigals, right? Pastors are not supposed to. They're supposed to be perfect. They all have perfect lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it was, it was just, it was very, very difficult. And we, so we had a prodigal. And these are the things you need to know about a prodigal. Number one, the prodigal journey always begins with hidden desires. Things that you don't know about. Do you really think that if the father of the prodigal that Jesus talked about, if he had known what his father was going to do, that he would have um, liquidated his assets and given everything that he, he, he was going to give to his son when he you know, inherited, do you think he was going to do that? No, he would never have done that. So it begins with hidden desires. You don't know what your child may desire in the depths of their hearts. Um, you don't know. You may think, you know, and you may, you may tell, I know everything you're thinking. I know everything you're going through. I know everything. You, and you can say that, but you don't know everything. You don't know everything that's deep in their hearts. Um, so the prodigal father did not know the journey that his son was going to, going to be taking. The second thing is that the prodigal's journey always takes him to a foreign country. Always takes him to a foreign country. Um, and, you know, they may, if you have a prodigal, that prodigal may not go outside of America. But that foreign country may be them doing and saying things and living a lifestyle that you never envisioned. It's, a, it's foreign to everything you taught them to do, everything you taught them to believe. They may be, begin to question, well, is God really real? I don't believe he's real. I've never seen him. I've, he's never done anything for me. And they may, they may have these ideas that you didn't put there, but somehow they got into their spirits. They got deep in there. They may adapt to a different culture. They may have a different mindset. They may begin to live differently than you ever thought they would live. Um, and you know what? This is, this is very important. If you have a prodigal in your life, I, I cannot express this to you enough. If you have a prodigal, and they have chosen to go to a foreign country, go to a faraway place from what you've ever taught them, let them go. Let them go. You cannot keep running after that child and pulling them back. You cannot keep 
bailing them out over and over and over again because their heart has to change before they will come back to the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. So they may go to a foreign country, but you have to let them go. The prodigal father, it, the word of God does not say he chased him. He, 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 he did not run down the road going, no, 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 please don't go. Please don't go. I'll change. I, he didn't do that. He did not search for that prodigal son. You know what he did? He sat on that porch and he prayed over and over again for that son to come home. And that's what we have to do. We have to pray and intercede that God will send that child back home. But that when he does, it will be with a heart change. The third thing is that the prodigal journey always produces waste. Always. Always produces waste. There may be a waste of gifts, a waste of talents, a waste of money, a waste of resources. When Jordan left home, she, she's a vocalist. She's got a beautiful, beautiful voice. And when she left home, she took all of her soundtracks and threw them in the garbage. There, there, were, there was no way for her to, to accompany herself in music. So she was going to say, okay, I don't want this anymore. It's going in the garbage. I'm done. So there may be waste. She, she threw away a lot of things. She didn't take her Bible with her. You know, you know, the Bible is the most important things in our lives. She didn't even take her Bible. She left it at home. So there was a waste there. And your child may have left things behind. They may have wasted their talents. They may have wasted the gifts that God has given them. There may be something that you never thought they would turn their back on, but they've wasted it. They've turned away from it. The fourth thing is the prodigal journey always produces famine and want. The prodigal journey always produces famine and want. Um, when the prodigal son was, had spent everything he had, he had wasted everything he had. He didn't even have money to buy food. And he looked at those pigs. Now remember, he was Jewish. These were unclean animals in the Jewish mind. Totally and completely unclean. He was not even supposed to be around them. A good Jew would not be around a pig. But here he was. He was sitting there and he was feeding the pigs. And all of a sudden, that bean looked really good to him. He was willing to eat the, the trash that the pigs were eating. And if, if I can leave you with one thing today... As, as the parent of a prodigal, I'm going to make this one statement. You need to write it down. Don't feed them when they're in the pig pen. Don't feed them in the pig pen. If your child has walked away, if you have a prodigal and they have walked away from the things of God, stop paying their phone bill. Stop bailing them out of jail. Stop giving them money to go out and eat. Stop putting gas in their car. Stop it. Stop it. Because they have to get to the point of famine and want for them to desire to turn back to the things of God. So don't feed them in the pig pen. I have a friend. Um, uh, well, she's, she's actually a friend of my daughter's. And um, I've known her since she was about 15 years old. She has a brother who is um, about two years younger than her. And he started drinking when he was about 13, 14 years old, and he became a raging alcoholic, went into drugs, and, and you know, everything that goes along with that, you know, getting arrested, losing his jobs, you know, getting out of jail, getting arrested again, all of these things that go along with that kind of a lifestyle. And Paula told me, she said, Miss Jelly, every time he gets arrested, my parents bail him out of jail. And she said, for 30 years... They have bailed him out of every problem he has ever had. And I said, every problem? And she said, yes, ma'am. Everything that he's ever done, they have bailed him out. They've made excuses for him. You know what? That kid is 43 years old. And they are still paying his bail. 
There's still, and you know what? If you keep feeding your child in the pig pen, if you keep making excuses for them, you're going to spend the rest of your life taking care of that child and making excuses for them and bailing them out. So don't feed them in the pig pen. So what principles? I, you know, this, this is what, this, you, know, you know the foundation you need to li- live. You know how this could have happened. You know what's, what this prodigal has been looking for. So what do you do now? What principles do you follow? First of all, we need to understand that the pig pen did not get up and leave the prodigal. The prodigal got up and he left the pig pen. Why? Because he was in pain. He was in pain. He was hungry. He had no, no shoes on his feet. He has his clothes were ready. He would probably stink to high heaven. You ever been around a pig pen? You know how bad it stinks? You know, mom and dad lived, um, when we were in Arkansas, mom and dad lived about three miles from a pig farm. And they weren't close to it. Didn't know it when they bought the house. But the wind would hit just right. And it would blow over their yard. And I'm telling you what, that was the worst kind of stink you can ever imagine. And chicken farms are almost as bad, but not, as, not quite as bad. <laughs> pig, pig pens, pig farms, they, they smell so bad. And you can get next to a pig farm or next to a pig pen. You just walk up to it, and you're going to walk away, and you're going to think you smell like it. And it's going to be in your sinuses, and you, it's, it's just, there's just nothing that's quite as bad a stink as that. And that, that prodigal son had been sitting with the pigs, looking at their food, knowing that that, that looked really good. I might, enjoy, I might enjoy eating that because he was so hungry and he was in so much pain and in so much want. And he had to come to the place where he knew if he was ever going to get help, he had to leave that pig pen. He had to start his journey back home to where God wanted him to be. There comes a time, and this is so hard, when you have to trust that God loves your prodigal more than you do. He loves your prodigal, and he wants your prodigal to come home. And you have to find a place in your spirit that you're willing to trust God, that he is going to see that prodigal home, that he is going to answer your prayers. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow leads to repentance. And we want our prodigals to repent. We want sorrow, if it is necessary for sorrow to bring them back. We want sorrow to be a part of their lives so that we can trust God and so that God can bring them back into the kingdom. The prodigal realized that he had sinned against God and he had sinned against his family. But he first realized he had sinned against God. He didn't say, oh, I did my parents wrong. No, 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 no. He said... The Bible says that he had realized he had sinned against God. And then he said, oh, I've sinned against my family too. And he had to recognize his sin and his life of sinfulness. And it was only when he realized the gravity of his bad decisions and faced the truth of what he had done that he saw reality. And when we have a prodigal that is living a life of, that is foreign to us, something that we have never envisioned before, we have to trust that God is going to bring them to a place of repentance. And repentance means turning from that way and and changing what they're doing. So he made a confession of his unworthiness to his father. He said, I, I'm, I'm not deserving of any honor. Um, he made a request to be a hired servant, not a slave. Now see, When I first read this, I thought, he's going to his dad, he's asking for a job. You know, he's he's taken all 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 of his inheritance, he's asking for a job, and he he, you know, the audacity. He he wasn't really repentant. No, 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 no. After I began to study this, I, I came to the understanding that he he knew if he had gone in and he said, Father, just make me as one of your slaves then that would have meant he was saying to his dad, Father, I have nothing. I don't. I, I, I want you to bring me into your home. I want to be like one of the family because slaves became 
family members. Slaves didn't become servants. They become family members. And the father knew, or the, the son knew, that if he had gone to this father and said, I want to be your slave, he would have, the father would have probably said, okay, son, that's fine. But he would have had to bring him into his home. He would have had to, to provide 100% for him. He would have had to do everything that he had done as a, prod, or as a son. He would have to embrace this son. But this prodigal didn't say that. He said, make me as a servant. Just, just give me a job to do, and I'll do anything you want me to do. It wasn't about the money. It was because he knew he didn't deserve to be a part of the family. And so this prodigal recognized deeply what he had done to wrong his family. He made his confession of unworthiness. He, he wanted to be a, a servant, not a slave. And he made the first steps to come home. The father didn't go get him. The father didn't send someone else to go get him. The father waited. He sat on that front porch. And you know what? When he was afar off, he saw his son coming. I don't know how he recognized his son. I don't know if he had 20-20 vision, 20-10 vision, 25. I don't, I don't know. All I know is that he saw his son, and he knew his son was coming home. And he knew that he had, he had the, the weight of the world on his shoulders. He knew he, was, he had spent everything. I mean, he, all he had to do was look at him, maybe be downwind of him. I don't know. But he knew, he knew that this was his boy. And his boy was coming home. And he recognized that. And the father didn't just stand there going, okay, come on. Tell me what you got. Tell me what you've done. He didn't say that. He, I, I bet that man dropped everything he was holding and ran to that boy. And you know what? That's what the Father does to us. When we have sinned, when we have done something wrong in our lives, he doesn't stand there with this big old mallet going, I told you not to do this. I told you not. He doesn't do that. He says, come home. Just come home. And that's what the Heavenly Father does for us. He's looking and he's saying, come home home. I love you. It doesn't matter what's in your past. I forgive all of that. So here we are. You've, you've found out, you know, what happens, you know, what could happen, what the, the foundation of your home should be, how it possibly happened in your home, and, and what your prodigal is going through, and what you have to do at this point in time to bring your, your prodigal back to the father, and for him to make that decision. Um, so you may have a prodigal. You may, um, you may have done everything you knew to do. I told my kids, don't you ever, don't you ever get on a psychologist's couch and blame me for your problems. Don't you ever do that because I've done the best I can do with the tools I had. And I have. I've done, I've done everything I knew to do. And still, I had two prodigals. I have had children that have failed. I've had children that have walked away from the Lord, as many of you have. And, and still, I keep praying. I may have messed up the parenting in their lives. I may have, have done a, a, a lot that um, I didn't know at the time was wrong. But don't accept the condemnation of the enemy of your soul today, saying, you really messed up. You screwed up your kids' lives. Don't accept that. That is not the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Um, the enemy wants you to take responsibility for your prodigal child. And if there was ever anything that the Lord spoke to my heart when, when Jordan was away from us, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the heart of that child that you gave birth to or that you adopted, that you so dearly love. It's about their heart, not about you. And the enemy wants you to take responsibility for it. He wants you to have condemnation in your life. Um, it's about their relationship with Jesus. Um, the Bible says, and I used this scripture earlier, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay? Okay? Old, old, old. It does, does not say, 
if you train up a child in the way he should go, when they are teenagers, they will never leave. It doesn't say train up a child in the way he should go, and when they become young adults, they'll never depart from the ways of the Lord. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that when your child gets married and starts having children of their own, that they're gonna that they're gonna live exactly the way that you taught them. It doesn't say they'll never depart. It says they'll when they're old. In other words, it takes some life experience for them to appreciate the training that you have given them. And that's where we are today. You cannot accept responsibility for the lifestyle your child is leading. It's painful. It hurts. Jordan was away from us for, for about six months. We didn't know where she was, what she was doing. Had no way to get in touch with her. She came back to the Lord. She wept. Her, her grandparents brought her to the house. And we saw her coming, and we ran off that porch. We didn't care what she'd done. We didn't care where she'd been. We didn't care the pain that she had brought us. All we wanted was to have our daughter home. And then when our second daughter walked away, that one was... She was away about a year, and um, she came in. It's really interesting. <laughs> Both of our kids, when Jordan came home, we were in the midst of our missions convention. When Danielle showed back up, she showed up at a prayer meeting because she knew. She knew that we were praying. We knew that she knew that, uh, you know, that God was moving in her heart. You know what? They were old, but they came home. And I'm telling you today, even with all the faults and the failures that my kids have had, it's not over. It's not the end. They're, they're living for Jesus, working for the Lord. Jordan is an entrepreneur. She's got a, um, a real gift of revelational knowledge. And Danielle is married to a physician. And they, she spent much of her young adult years in, in India and working in missions. My, old, my youngest daughter, Elena, uh, she never really lived a prodigal lifestyle, but she is working in a church in Indiana. Um, Alden, my oldest nephew that lives with me, is, is, um, he's, he's working at a church up here somewhere in North Atlanta, I think North Point. And um, he's, he's not employed. We'd like for him to be employed, but he's not employed there. He's working on his own. But he's, he is so in love with Jesus. He can't get enough of Jesus. And Reagan, my, my, my youngest nephew, is finishing up at Berry College with a chemical engineering degree. And he loves Jesus. That's all we can ask for is for them to love Jesus and work for the Lord. So if you are in a place right now where you have a prodigal child, don't give up. Don't give up on the dreams that you have for them. Don't give up in prayer. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep standing on the porch and waiting for them to come home because they're coming home. They're coming home. Pastor Jeff.